welcome to the fourth episode of A Little Night Podcast. Of course, we come to you every Monday night talking all things musicals and sun time. I am tonight's host, Emily Parker, the fundraising coordinator at Nest. Uh, this episode, we're talking all things girls. N- not like that, actually. Um, we're going to be um, discussing our favorite uh, sun time characters, some shows that we like. So yeah, we have uh, three guests today. We have Anna Smith, who is our publicity manager. In the words of Lizzo, I just took a DNA test. Turns out I'm 100% that witch. <laughs> you are crazy. Um, and we have two brand new guests, uh, some members of the Northeast Stephen Sondheim Theatre Company, quite a mouthful, Ellen Maven. Hiya, I don't think I could quite top Anna's uh, introduction there, so I'll just say hiya. No more Lizzo quotes from you, no? Oh, not off the top of my head, I'm not that witty. Or (laughs) witty. No, uh, it wasn't very good. And Grace, Grace Wimpen. (laughs) Hello, I hope you're doing well. I'm good, thanks Grace. So, we're going to kick it off with you, Grace. Who would you say is your favourite female Sondheim character? You know, there are so many... Good one. So many fantastic characters in the catalogue of Sondheim works, but True. my first and probably my favourite is The Baker's Wife in Into the Woods. I mean, The Witch springs to mind, mind as well, but it was actually Joanna Gleason who won the Tony for Best Leading Actress in a Musical. Yeah, so yeah, I'd like to talk about Baker's Wife. Baker's Wife it is. <laughs> So a bit of background on The Baker's Wife, if you're not familiar with Into the Woods, there probably there will be spoilers. Um, she is, Baker's Wife is the every woman. She's not a witch, she's not a princess, she's just normal and she wants to have a child and she is married to Baker. Um, she's very dissatisfied with her life and her situation and the witch says, you can have a child if you get me these four things. And everything in Act One is leading towards having a child. And she very much drives the plot forward and is just really proactive. Uh, yeah, I think I agree. <laughs> she uh, goes on a quest and I think there's maybe some um, malicious... Ness. Is that a word? Yeah, mal- I think it's malice. But yeah, there's malice. definitely malice. some... <laughs> She's definitely not above using deceit to get what she wants. Yeah. Um, she, When she meets Jack in the woods with the baker, she literally says, you know what? We will buy the cow for these beans. And these aren't just any other beans. These beans are magical. And she, she doesn't know that they are. Uh, but yeah, she is. She's not beyond doing things that are immoral to get what she wants. When she gets the hair from Rapunzel, she literally fakes her identity. She puts on the voice of the prince and says, "Let down your hair to me, Rapunzel." And then she actually injures her when she's getting the hair, <laughs> uh, which is it's hilarious. But you're thinking. That's that's not okay. Um, but you know she, she gets the child, so <laughs> so at the end of that, justifiable. I think she could have said sorry and explained. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think that might have helped. But then when she meets Cinderella in the woods, she you know she tries to explain, and yet Cinderella is like, "Don't come near me! Don't attack me!" And she says, "I didn't attack you. I attacked your shoe." I just. A fine line, um, but yeah, she tries to explain, but it it doesn't really go down that well. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I think, obviously, spoiler alert, the baker's wife dies. Shocker! Shocker. Um, (laughs) I don't know whether I'd say that her, uh, her means justify the ends. Well, bring it back to the show. Um, I don't. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I think she's just so desperate, and yeah. she's trying to. What she and the baker, they both really want this child, and I think they they think this child will solve all their problems. 
But as you see at the start of Act 2, they've had this child and, you know, they, they're wishing for another room, more room in their house. So it's the, you're constantly wanting more. Um, I think there's a great there's a great quote which it says, in the first midnight, it says, you may know what, need, what you need, but to get what you want, it's easy to keep what you have, what you have already. And I think that really, that really rings true, especially at the moment. You've just got to be grateful for what you have. It's great to be aspirational and you know want another thing but you know just just check in with what you have that's a really good moral I think from Into the Woods yeah I think I'd agree Anna do you have any uh character that sticks out to you I absolutely adore Petra from A Little Night Music yeah um, I think it's really interesting that she's pretty much silent the whole way through the show she has like a couple of sung lines in a weekend in the country and a, probably a few other lines here and there um but she's a silent character essentially um and then you get to the miller's son and you have a woman talking openly about like um not wanting to commit and adultery and sex um on stage um set you know way back when that was not cool to talk about that at all um in private with another woman never mind on stage um and I just think it's a really brilliant way of you know showing that women also have these thoughts and women aren't just um ingenues or um I don't know mothers there are you know there are women in every role in society and it's so rare that you you see that on stage anyway. Never mind, like in the context of a little of a little night music, where it's, you know, in the age where the dinosaurs roamed the planet. <laughs> True, all facts, all facts. Yeah, I think I've never really thought about it that way. I think that's a really interesting way to. I suppose you don't really focus on that as much. Yeah, but it was it's definitely. Like that of the time that a little night music sorry you go uh, it's like that outpour of emotion when you finally get to talk about something that you've wanted to talk about for a long time like when you meet someone yeah. with the same passion as you and you're like oh my god do you like RuPaul too let's talk about it for two hours straight it's very that kind of um you know outpour um, where she just can't stop talking and fantasizing, um, and it's brilliant. It's it's not contained in any way. It's all so organic, um, and the ins- like the instrumentation that goes alongside it. That kind of like driving rhythm, oh, unbelievable! Best, my favorite female Sondheim character by a mile. It's like Sondheim's a genius or something. I don't know. It's yeah, he's all right. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Ellen, you've been very quiet over there. Do you oh. have any? Any opinions to share? Um, I kind of agree. And it kind of segues nicely into um, my character because the female, well, I'm I'm just going to talk about Bobby from Company. She's Ooh. like my complete, like a company has been my favorite show for like years. And I was lucky enough to go and see it last, uh, a couple Halloweens ago um, when it was the female revival. And when I saw Bobby as a woman, I think she's such an amazing character and very similar to like what happens in The Miller's Son. She says, I don't, she's very much like, I don't want to settle down. I don't want to have a husband. Um, And I think that's really, really important. And it was so refreshing to see that on like a 2018 stage. Because I think she takes what celebrated a male culture and is often frowned upon in female culture and normalizes like women's urges to do so. So like women are all like try to keep this PG, but women are often like shamed for having like a certain outlook on life. Like they don't want kids, they don't want to ha- settle down, they want to kind of be with other people and as many people as possible. I think that's really interesting. Now it's not like discredit the male Bobby, but when I look at female characters across the board, they always have someone. Like, when we talked about The Baker's Wife, she's a really strong woman and everything that Grace said was, like, very, very, like, relevant and valid. But she still has the baker and her motive is still the child. It's not that she wants to be completely, like, on her own. Um, And when I look up on the stage, I like to see someone that I can connect with. And I think this is why I'm a little biased to this character because I connect so strongly to her ideals. I don't know about you guys. 
I yeah, think, I think what you touched on with the baker's wife is very interesting because the baker's wife is literally doesn't have a name. Her name is attached to the male counterpart of the show. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I completely agree with you there. I yeah. definitely agree. But I mean, it's like, really it's stri- it's st- <laughs> Oh, go, on, go for it. Um, I definitely feel like it's really refreshing to have this this woman, um, this female Bobby who you know has all these it is independent um i would say the baker's wife i think she when i first listened to into the woods i thought oh baker's wife she's not an important character because she's attached to the baker i didn't know anything about the show at first and then as i listened to it i thought this is a real person i think she the fact that she doesn't have a character doesn't devalue as a character it's just that i think it subvert your expectations as an audience member she think oh cinderella i know about her rapunzel i know her story the witch know what to expect but then you've got who is this is she important and then she is i think um one thing about company is it does really kind of subvert the female stereotypes like across all of its characters you see um like amy when you think of someone you know getting ready for their wedding you you hear the same cold feet, um, but you really see what that means with Amy. Um, and same with Joanne. You you see these like rich middle class couples. You think, oh God, I hope that's me when I'm like, I don't know, 45, 50. Um, but actually their they their marriage is very different to how it's presented in public. Um and I think the way they did it with uh Jamie in the 2018 revival it was refreshing um however I think there's just something about having a female Amy as well um you know seeing a woman be that kind of stressed um openly um you know women aren't again like don't show your emotions don't be a stress head but getting to see that on stage is it's really nice. Um, and I like that with a lot of Sondheim female characters, you get to see their in, like their kind of inner dialogue um, as well as what they say kind of out loud. Yeah. I think yeah. that's very interesting that you brought up Jamie because obviously in the, in the gender reversal production, the 2018 revival, Amy is now Jamie. And I think that's very interesting to see that thought process on a man yeah as well like obviously we're focusing a lot on female but that sort of process has been more not humanized but that it can be related both to both genders i think that's why i wanted to talk about bobby so much because i think a lot of her experiences is very relatable to what you've just said emily about how um the experiences that people, every single thing that we experience happens on both a male and a female spectrum. And then every, every, obviously everything in between. And I just think like, it's really interesting to see how these kind of experiences are reflected. um, Kind of like a mirror, if that makes any sense. (laughs) Yeah, I think, yeah. I think I agree that by company... Um, gender swap in this role I think it humanizes Bobby and the show in that um, these reactions that Bobby is having are human reactions as opposed to male reactions or female reactions and that everybody goes through this in love and life and that gender has no tie to any of those feelings yeah definitely Yeah. yeah I mean when when you compare the two scripts, the 1970 script with the 2018 script, there are hardly any um, alterations made other than yeah. pronouns, really. There's um, there's no, especially in terms of uh, Bobby's dialogue and uh, lyric, there's really not a lot of changes. And I think it's, it's like what Emily said, you can literally copy and paste these emotions and these thoughts onto someone of a complete, of a different gender and they mean the same thing. Um, yeah, it's very really nice. Definitely, definitely. I think it's really interesting to see like a character so content when we're saying about um, talking about like reflection. Um, 
going back to my previous point about how women are kind of like, oh, you've got a biological clock, you, oh, have you settled down yet, kind of thing, and they go through that. Luckily, I haven't, because, I mean, I'm only 21, but a lot of women do go through that. A lot of my friends have been through that, and I like how Bobby can just so confidently come onto a stage and be like, you know what it is? It's okay that I don't want this. She's actually really, truly content on being on her own. And then she's also addressing how for women, while we don't see that on Amy's part, we see it in Bobby that being with one person for the rest of your life may feel like kind of daunting, but she also shows herself how it can be beautiful and shows herself how the good outweighs the bad in the situation. Because I also wanted to touch upon the song being alive because even though she's got all these people being like, oh, we've got a fella, like, um, I've got a fella for you, I've got this person for you, uh, what are you settling down? And she actually, at the end, she comes to that conclusion on her own, like that maybe marriage isn't so scary, maybe love isn't isn't so scary, but she doesn't come from to that conclusion from a place of peer pressure. And I think that's very interesting as well. She, I think she is really a strong, kind of independent person that kind of makes her own decisions. She lets other people influence her, of course, as we all do. It's like going back to the whole, this is a human reaction to what's going on. Um, yeah, I think that's what, yeah. It is really refreshing to see a character just completely uh, as a single person who you can you can relate to, and it's it's really nice because you just sort of every time you see oh this person's married to this person or they fancy them and you kind of like it's it's lovely to see someone who is so content and just at peace with themselves, and I think that's great, especially as they changed the gender to the female it's really it's really empowering actually that as, as a woman it is okay to be approaching 30 or um, however old Bobby is and to be single that's fine it's whatever makes you happy definitely Anna do you have something to yeah. say um I just want to draw a parallel into like another kind of pop culture um thing so you've got bobby um single at 35 well it's a 35th birthday um when the show opens um i just wanted to draw a parallel to bridget jones who is 32 in the first movie um and just to kind of um you know what we see in pop culture as you know the single female like the crazy plant lady or the crazy cat lady who maybe should lose a few pounds to be loved or you know smokes too much or drinks too much um and then we see Bobby, who, you know, she has her life together, really. She's got friends. She's probably got a decent job. You know, she can afford to live in New York um, and hang around with people with good jobs and nice houses. So I just think it's a really interesting parallel. Um, you know, it really flips that stereotype on its head that women can be, you know, inverted commas, eligible bachelors, too. Um, they can you can be single and have your life together. You don't have to be Bridget Jones. Now, speaking as a Bridget Jones, um, <laughs> those women do exist. But, um, you know, there are women out there who you can be happy and successful without, like, and be single. And for a lot of women, meeting someone else is a bonus and like an add-on to their life and not the end goal. And I think that's something that is highlighted really well in the 2018 adaptation. Yeah, like... I, th I completely agree with that because looking in my experience I I definitely do see that meeting someone is like and as an add-on I would I'm more like putting my career and stuff forward I'd lo like to travel the world and if you do want to every single person's experience in this world is different and it is kind of like I said like I, it's like I said before when I look up on a stage I like to see someone that I can relate to and I really relate to Bobby and it's nice to see that you can be successful and you don't have to be shamed about your life decisions it's okay to be like oh well I'm single and I don't have a child and I'm like 35 and that's okay and people are just like oh cool um and I remember like reading something in, about Sondheim and saying that most theater is about an escape from your reality, whereas Sondheim likes to challenge his audiences and put them in front of like a mirror as if like you're watching something that you are a part of and that you are, you're watching yourself on stage. And I think that is so relevant with the 2018 version because I've obviously said a lot about that, but yeah. Do you think, think there's 
any other Sondheim shows that would work with a flipped gender in mm. any roles? You know what? I'd love to see female Toby and Sweeney Todd. Toby? Yeah. Why Toby? Because, I mean, I don't really feel like his gender is relevant to the story anyway. I feel like he, he is a vulnerable young person, um, not always a child. And he is, they are really, they go through some dark things. And you can get a different dynamic with Pirelli and also with Mrs. Lovett later on. If perhaps Toby is played by a woman, I think that would be really interesting. Vocally, it might be a bit of a challenge. A lot of it's quite high in tenery, but it's, I think it would be really interesting theatrically. Anna? Yeah, the first time I performed in Sweeney Todd, um, the actor who played Toby was trans. Um, and it was really, it's really interesting because um, there was no, there was at no at no point being another actor in the show did I ever question that decision. There was, I think, a role like Toby. Um, it's all about, like you said, that vulnerability, um, and the the kind of edge to him. There's uh, or her or they. There's no real need for the the gender to be specified in any way. Um, yeah, I think it really worked. And I think that's something that can be brought forward into a lot of theatre where a trans actor can play a trans character and not have to, it doesn't have to mean anything. They can just exist yeah. in the world of the play. Um, I think and it goes that, back to... It is what it is. It goes back to the characters being, like having human relations as opposed to those being tied to gender, I think. Yeah. yeah, definitely. It's like that mirror that I just said before, like there could be it, somebody who is perhaps non, like, because we're talking about Toby here as if like his gen like their gender doesn't like matter. It could be like a non-binary person sitting in the audience and being like, oh, their, their, their gender or their, how they identify is completely irrelevant to their story. And I think that's kind of, it's kind of beautiful, I think. Yeah. yeah. I think it can yeah. be... A, a lot of the time, especially as a woman, your your physical appearance can across musical theatre and the media and the hot uh, in general, your physical appearance is often a plot point. Um, as someone who has been overweight, that's all. It means that in a lot of conventional musicals, that's always going to be a plot point. You're going to be the Tracy in Hairspray. You're not necessarily going to be a character where weight is irrelevant. It's really it, it really is, particularly for women, I don't feel that, I feel that there is a massive double standard in musical theatre with physical appearance and women. And it's so frustrating, but it's great that we're talking about it. Yeah, definitely. I think this runs uh, into my idea of how amateur dramatics use gender in that when I was uh, younger... Um, there was a lot of shows that we did. We did Joseph. We did Seven Brides with Seven Brothers. Um, and in all of these shows, I played males as like a nine-year-old girl who was still trying to work out what what our place was in the world. And I was extremely tall. And I think that kind of just pocketed me into, well, you're tall. You don't fit along the girl's. In the show, you can play older characters, you can play male characters. Um, yeah. Do you have any experiences of playing men as children? I definitely do. I definitely yeah. do. Even even like when I'm having a look at like, um, I've just finished my three years of training at uni and looking at even just something as simple as being in like a dance class and doing dance performance I've I was always like all of the short petite girls not to say that there's anything wrong with them but it just so happened that the shorter petite girls were put with the boys in the class we only had about six or seven boys in our class and then I would also be a 
made like one of the boy the boy part in the dance if it was like a partner dance and I would always be that and I was I remember like asking my dance teacher and I said is there any chance I could like you know like I could be partnered with the boys because there was a, there were boys that were taller than me and I would so it was just a bit confusing for me and I just basically said like is there any chance that I could get the opportunity to play a, 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 like the girl kind of part and she was just saying like oh it's because of your height and your build there's just girls that are more suited it to it and I think that is such a toxic thing personally because like I like as a woman I am valid I am a valid person to play anything I want to be whether it is a man's part in a dance or a woman's part and I think it's very kind of toxic to say oh well you're a certain going back to what Grace said about like size and stuff like that I think it's quite not okay to be like oh well Emily you're a certain height so you have to play this role and you haven't got to say in the matter because who going back to our recent production of um, Merrily We Roll Along I am shoulders above uh, Matthew College who played Frank I am like we're completely two different sizes but on stage who's to say that that dynamic didn't work with me as Beth and him as Frank I think I, yeah yeah <laughs> what does think, anyone else think I think obviously uh, there's many logistical problems about like younger where I came from there was not that many boys um, and obviously in your dance class there's not that many there wasn't there was like seven boys did you say yeah but, um yeah, I definitely think there's opportunity for everyone to learn how to be a girl and learn that element. Even the of boys. Theater. Yeah, even the boys if they want to. Anna? I think um, one thing for girls, it really, what Ellen said about like the dance teachers being like, oh, well, they're better suited to the role. Those things really embed ideas into your head. Um, so I'm five foot like three if that I am not very tall Um, and I grew up really quite skinny um, and I would still be put like as a boy um, because there were girls who were skinnier than me um, to the point where now I am one of the shortest people in my class and I automatically when we go to do partner work I will make myself a boy just like out of default because I think like oh well I was told that one time when I was nine that I was too heavy um so I'm gonna put myself as a boy so I don't have to face that like rejection um same with when we did Shakespeare um recently we did Twelfth Night and when they were like who do you want to be I was like Malvolio please let me be a boy so I don't have to like try and be a girl um which I think is hilarious because when you get these ideas as a, as a young woman, when you get these ideas instilled into you, like, oh, you're tall, so you can only play all parts or you're small and like, so you can only play like little comedy parts or um, I don't know, you're too big, you're too thin. Uh, they really stick with you. And like, no matter what you kind of grow up to look like or to act like or to sound like, you automatically put yourself back in that box. And I think it's really sad because for, for the most part, it does stem from amateur dramatics or like local dance schools that kind of instill that um, thought pattern into you from when you first start your training. Yeah. Ellen? I think that is such a relevant point. I think it is so valid because even when, like through when, I, when I've been doing stuff, like stuff at uni, stuff with other amateur dramatic groups, I've always been like put into that box. And I think my first kind of female-esque role would have been in Chicago when I was one of the the Merry Murdresses. And I remember getting the role and I was like, I can't do that. And then I did it. And then I got the role of Gussie originally in the uh, in the show that we've just done, Merrily We Roll Along. And I remember like getting that role with like alongside Emily when we were double cast back in the back in the OG days where and I was thinking how am I gonna I read the script how am I gonna play that the least sexy the least feminine person on the planet how am I gonna play that and it stems from it's not a fact that I am not feminine and I am not sexy it's the fact that I don't have the experience or lack of experience of playing those kind of roles and being that kind of person and it kind of made me into I mean I'm wearing a dress right now but like I I do 
I would go for a pair of pants rather than a dress because that's just the box that I've been fitted into that I am like a more masculine person and with a more masculine build and a masculine height. I mean, I'm only five foot eight. I'm not, I'm not like massive. <laughs> but yeah. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Thanks. I wanted to say that I go back to when you're young and you, I went to a girls' school from the age of 11 and did play lots of male roles. And I think when you are a teenager, you are, you're always thinking, well, personally, what I was thinking was, what does everyone else think of me? Why, why have I been cast in this role? And actually, I think when you are young, especially, it can be another barrier to stop you relating to a character. You might, even when you're reading a book in English, lessons together some like someone in the class had to read the male role and you can't, it was kind of a barrier mentally there was nothing wrong with doing it but when you were just between the ages of 11 and 18 and you're thinking oh what's the one thing what is it because I have big shoulders <laughs> like why am I playing this man and it was always the same and it was always the female roles to be chosen first and it was just really tough to um, have the confidence to go actually I want to play this role and I can relate to this say Jack in Into the Woods you could you could say oh yeah I'm going to play uh, this this role or we're going to read it in a rehearsal and there's nothing wrong with doing that but I think you get really uptight and self-conscious especially as a performer because you're constantly judging you constantly compare when you go to auditions you're going to be up there with people who look like you and it's a real you can it can get quite um it, it can be quite easy to be quite uptight and um aware of how you look and you just think this is me this is how I am I'm going to read for this role and my physical appearance and my gender doesn't limit what I can do yeah that I, was a rant. <laughs> I think on that point we should uh we should wrap up the podcast to our hour over our time limit um so yeah um thank you everyone for listening thank you to my guests for coming to chat with me it got a bit deep but i think it was a really insightful conversation to have actually i really enjoyed it um and we'll see you all next week for episode five bye